Good evening again, dear students. Hope you are all safe and doing well. I will start. Now, last week we have finished with the anatomy of the face and scalp, and today we will start with the anatomy of the oral oral cavity. Now, the oral cavity, all you know, or you have an oral cavity, is the first part of the GI GI tract. The oral cavity contains number of structures which aid in mastication and mastication and chewing chewing of food and then pushing the food into the oral pharynx the oral cavity itself or oral region form includes the cavity containing the teeth or the gingiva surrounding it containing the, the tongue and then the palate and region of palatine tonsil Oral cavity, usually the dentists call it the buccal, the buccal cavity. They use the buccal cavity more commonly than the oral cavity. And it's formed of two portions, it's formed of the vestibule, which is the anterior part, and the cavity, cavity proper. Now the vestibule, The vestibule of the oral cavity is the portion which lies between the lips, the cheeks, and then between the alveolar arch and teeth. This is the vestibule in this picture. The mouth has been, has been opened. This is the roof of the oral cavity, and here is the floor of the oral cavity. We see here is the tongue. This is the entry into the oropharynx. Now the vestibule is this portion. The vestibule is this portion which lies between the lips here and then between the cheeks to the outer side forming the outer boundaries of it and from the inside as the alveolar arch, both alveolar arch and the carrying tooth inside it. When you close your mouth, when you close your mouth this looks like a getter a horseshoe shaped gutter which is closed completely and separated from the rest of the oral cavity but opens into the oral cavity only behind the last molar teeth here you can pass your finger now close your teeth and then pass your finger into the vestibule till you reach the last molar teeth then you from there you can pass toward the oral oral cavity Otherwise, with closing of the teeth, this vestibule is completely separated from the oral cavity by the tooth, occluding tooth, of the alveolar arch. So the boundaries of the vestibule from the outer surface are the two lips with the oral orifice between them, or oral fissure bounded by the upper and lower lower lips and then on each side is the lateral wall the cheeks the lips upper and lower lips all vestibule is narrow bounded by externally as i said the lips the cheeks and internally are the gums and teeth of the alveolar arts communicates with the exterior through the oral fissure Above and below is limited by reflection of mucosa to the, to the gums. And below is limited by reflection of mucosa to the gums, forming a horseshoe-shaped shop. Posteriorly is continuous with the oral cavity proper behind the last molar teeth. Formed of two parts, labial sulcus, which is related to the labial side, and buccal sulcus, which is related to the to the gums. Now, bounded interiorly by the two, two lips. The two lips are two fleshy folds surrounding the oral, oral orifice. As you know, externally, each lip is from the outside covered with the, with the, so the skin and then internally by the mucosa. Enclosing the muscles, which you have studied the muscles of the of the lips, which we call them the orbicularis oris. This is here wrong. It's orbicularis oris, not oculi. I'm sorry for that. 
within these, between the skin and the mucosa, in addition to the muscles contain vessels, nerves, and fibro-disposed tissue, numerous small labial salivary, salivary glands. The junction between, between the skin and then change into mucous membrane, this is called the vermilion border of the, of the lips. It's reddish. This is a transitional zone depending on degree of melanization. And this is covered by thin keratinized epithelium with connective tissue papilla. The color of it looks pinkish because it's thinner than the skin and then the blood vessels are very near to the surface of mucosa. It's devoid of salivary gland, but usually contains sebaceous, sebaceous glands. Now, so each, each lip is formed of skin from the outside, mucous membrane from the inside, and the pinkish color portion is covered with mucous membrane. And as you know, girls or the females all the time, they put what was called the lipstick. Previously, was called, was called, it was only reddish, reddish. In color nowadays, they put a lot of color starting from white, bright glistening till the black, the black one. Pending their, their lips from the vermilion, vermilion border. Shifa is a sire Abiyat Shifa, real Aswat Shifa, using all, all the colors. Now, looking to the two lips, as you know, if you look to, to your own lips through a mirror, a mirror, you will see that there is difference between the upper and the lower, the lower lip. The lower lip is formed of only of a single, single portion. This is because the lower lip is derived embryologically from fusion of the two mandibular, mandibular swellings in the anterior median line, while the upper lip is formed of three portions. A central portion which is depressed and surrounded by two ridges or elevations, elevations, we call these the tubercles, the lateral ridges or the tubercle, and then the two lateral, lateral parts. So the upper lip is formed of three, three portions, a central which we call the philtrum and two lateral parts separated from the philtrum by a ridge or a tubercle. This is because the central portion of the upper lip, that is the philtrum, is formed from fusion of two medial nasal swellings embryologically. The two lateral parts results from fusion of maxillary swelling on each side with the medial nasal, nasal swelling, causing this, this ridge, and that's why it's formed of three, three portions, because four swellings share in this formation, while the lower lip only two swellings share in its formation. This is for the lips and the opening between the two lips, of course, this is the oral, oral fissure, and the extent and the length of the oral, oral fissure, which is again determined genetically, the extent of it might be small in some the oral orifice, in some people it's very large, in some it's small, in some it's medium, and this results genetically from fusion of the maxillary swelling above with the mandibular swellings below, creating this angle of the, of the mouth and the extent of this oral fissure. <clears throat> now, this is for the anterior walls of the vestibule. Now, laterally, the lateral walls of the vestibule are formed by the cheeks. And this is limited by the nasolabial sulcus and nasolabial fold lateral, lateral to it. Again, the cheeks, as you know, from the outside, we have studied in the face and the skin. And this contains superficial fascia containing the adipose tissue, vessels, nerves. The adipose tissue usually is called buccal fat of fat. In addition, contains connective tissues, nerves, vessels, buccal salivary glands, salivary glands. From the outside, it's covered with the skin. From the inside is the mucous, mucous membrane. The most muscle, the large muscle contained within the cheeks, as you have seen, is the, is the buccinator, buccinator muscle forming most of the lateral wall of the 
vestibule. The buccal pad of fat, this is a variable amount of adipose tissue, usually during the childhood, this is buccal pad of fat. This aids, aids in, in suckling in the neonates, the buccal pad of fat. With age, usually this, this decreases. Now, from the outside is covered with the skin. From the inside is the mucous membrane, which is orthocalatinized stratified squamous epithelium. Contains inside it a parotid papilla. This is a conical elevation, conical elevation, situated situated opposite the upper second molar molar teeth. Conical situation, conical projection is called parotid papilla. And on the summit of this papilla, there is the opening of the parotid duct. So the parotid duct opens into the vestibule of oral cavity opposite the upper second molar teeth. If you look, look to the lateral side or from the inside of the cheeks, the vestibule, you can see this small, small conical papilla, papilla with the omnute opening in the summit of it. This is the duct opening of the duct of parotid, parotid gland. We have seen in boxinator that is pierced by the duct of parotid gland pierces it and then opens into the mucous membrane of the vestibule on the summit of this parotid papilla. Now, so there are some mucous cerebellar glands which are part of the parotid, usually four or five lie over the parotid gland over the vaccinator. Their ducts also pierce the vaccinator and open near last molar teeth. They lie between vaccinator and and the mucosa, but their ducts these are very minute, cannot be seen by the neck, by the neck, uh, usually. But seen is only the opening of the duct of the parotid, parotid gland. Contains, now, this is for the lateral walls. If we pass inside the vestibule, the inner walls of the vestibule, as I said, are formed by the teeth, by the teeth, and the gums covering the alveolar, alveolar arch, and then it's reflected as mucous membrane over the cheek and over, over the lips. If you pull your lower lip forward by two fingers and look to the inside, you will see that the lower lip is attached by a fold of mucous membrane to the gums, to the gums between the mid incisors, between the left and right right incisors this is called the frenulum of the of the lip of the lower lower lip sometimes lateral frenula might cross vestibule in the region of canine or premolar and if these are thick then might lead to separation between the incisors and and canine there will be a, a space between the canines and the incisors the same thing for the upper lip, if you elevate it, there is again a short frenulum passing from the inner aspect of the lower upper lip toward the, between the upper, upper mid incisors. Now, few, few clinical applications, a cleft clip, cleft clip, yani shafatil arna or scald hair lip. Cleft lip result, result from failure of fusion of swellings. It usually affects the upper lip, very rarely affect the lower lip, and usually is lateral, lateral cleft clip. Lateral cleft clip, it means separation between the maxillary swelling and medial nasal swelling due to failure of fusion of these swellings medial nasal swelling with the maxillary swelling lead to cleft clip or hair lip. Sometimes it's just an indentation in the region of the tubercle of the upper lip and sometimes might lead to complete separation of the lateral part of upper lip from the philtrum on one, on one side. This is cleft cleft clip. Carcinoma of the lip occurs usually is of the type of squamous cell carcinoma, usually involves the lower lip. 
and usually occurs in old in old age and usually it's not a case a cause of of death the carcinoma might spread of the lower lip if you remember we said the lymph drainage of the lower lip is to the submental lymph nodes might pass to the submental and or the submandibular lymph nodes but usually occurs in old age and is not the cause of death Cyanosis of lips, it means, we said that the lips usually looks pinkish in color due to a proximity of blood vessels to the surface. And this cyanosis, it means bluish coloration of the lips. They change, the color change from the pinkish to the bluish. This occurs in cases where there is reduced oxygen tension in the blood. When there is reduced oxygen tension, which you have seen a lot of cases in this period during the corona, COVID-19, most of the patients, they suffer from low, low O2 tension and they suffer from this cyanosis. Decreased O2 tension leads to bluish coloration of the, of the lips and also bluish coloration of the nails of the of the fingers again you, you all of these they look they look pinkish in color because of proximity of vessels below the nails when there is decreased o2 tension due to any cause due to any cause nowadays it was very common in the time of covid 19 it's very common those cases who suffer from dyspnea affection of the lungs decreased or lead to decreased oxygen tension of the blood and lead to this bluish coloration of the lips, cyanosis of lips. Large labial frenia, as I said, each, each lip is connected by a fold of mucous membrane to between the incisors because frenulum sometimes might be very large and thick and cause a space between the, between the incisors. And large lower frenula, large lower, lower frenula, may contribute to the gingival, gingival recession leading to exposure, exposure of the root of the tooth. In the buccal mucosa, you can see also sebaceous, sebaceous glands, which are normal and usually they appear as yellowish spots, mercury it means spots. It's called for these spots. If you, especially if you stretch, stretch the cheek and the, the number increase at puberty. The gums or gingiva. This is composed of dense vascular connective tissue covered by, as I said, orthokeratinates, squamous stratified epithelium, it's firmly attached to the cement of the neck of the tooth and to the bone all of the other process. Contains melanosoid producing melanosomes, Langerhans cells, these are nerve sensitive cells that are sensitive for pain, touch and temperature. Now on the inner aspect of the wall of the, of the vestibule, as I said, is the gums or the gingiva, gingiva. Again, inflammation of the gums, we call it gingivitis, is inflammation of the gingiva due to any cause. You will face in the future a lot of cases of gingivitis, gingivitis. Next, you have periodontitis. This is inflammation of the alveolar bone and periodontal, periodontal membrane. You will study these, of course, in the next series in details. Sometimes an abscess might occur, might occur in the dento-alveolar, dento-alveolar abscess between the alveolar bone and the root of the, of the teeth. Abscess, it means accumulation of inflammatory, inflammatory fluid due to bacterial infection or viral infection and the abscess sometimes might open and drain into the oral cavity or into, into the lips. Abscess, yani horage. Abscess, accumulation of pus, which is a result of inflammatory process due to bacterial or viral, viral infections. So this is for the vestibule of the oral, oral cavity. 
Now the vestibule, as we said, is closed and separated from the oral cavity proper, except behind the last molar teeth. You can pass your finger behind the last molar teeth and then enter into the oral, the oral cavity. Now children's minds usually they refuse to take to take drugs to take drugs directly directly. You can give drugs to the, to the children by by a syringe without a needle a syringe you pull and then put the syringe in the vestibule push it toward the last smaller teeth and then inject the drug there and then the child will be obliged to swallow to swallow the drug and you will not test it. Now from the vestibule, if you open your teeth, then you enter inside the oral cavity, oral cavity proper. Now the oral cavity proper is like, like a box. It's closed, it's closed anteriorly and laterally by the teeth and the alveolar arch. It has a roof which separates it from the nasal cavity above and it has a floor which separates it from the structures in the neck. And it has a posterior entry into the oral pharynx. And this posterior entry, we call it isthmus of fauces. So the oral cavity proper is bounded by alveolar arch, so the tooth. The roof of it, we call it the palate, and it has a floor communicates posteriorly with the oral pharynx through its mesophoses, communicates with the vestibule, as he said, behind the last molar teeth. So it has a roof, it has a floor, anterior and lateral walls are the teeth and the alveolar, alveolar arch. You will study the teeth and you studied them in your dental anatomy last, last, last year and you have studied the alveolar arch, the alveolar process of maxilla and the uh, body of the mandible which carries the lower our teeth. Now what remains is the roof of the oral cavity and the floor of the oral cavity. The roof of the oral cavity, the roof of the oral cavity is called the palate. Forms the palate, forms roof of the oral cavity, at the same time forms the roof, the floor of the nasal now the roof of the mouth, so we call it the palate, separates it from the nasal cavity. The palate is formed of two portions, an anterior portion which is called the heart palate and the posterior portion which projects partly into the, the pharynx, into the pharynx is called the soft, the soft palate is formed of soft tissue, the heart palate is formed of bones. Now in this, in this slide, we are looking in the upper half of it, we are looking to the roof of the oral, oral cavity. Here is the upper lip. This is the upper superior alveolar arch carrying the upper teeth. And here is the palate, the heart palate, the bone on one side, it's the heart palate, the mucous membrane upper it has been removed and the rest is the soft palate till this posterior conical projection. The two are continuous. A study of last year, we have studied the skull, we have studied the palate as the, from the maxilla is formed partly by the maxilla, which is called the palatine process of the maxilla and it's formed by the shared by the horizontal blade of palatine bone. On each side, on each side, the heart palate is formed of two bones. This is the palatine process of the maxilla, which forms nearly the anterior three-fourths. Sorry, of the heart palate. And then the posterior one fourth of it is formed by the horizontal plate of the palatine bone. The two bones fuse with the suture, the suture and then the other side formed by the same two bones, they fuse with each other again in the anterior median, median line, they form what is called the cruciate suture. 
cross like cross light suture is called cruciate suture. So two horizontal plates of palatine bone with two palatine processes of the maxilla. Posteriorly, it projects in the anterior, in the posterior median line, forming what is called posterior nasal spine. And it has a posterior free border, this hard pellet. This is the posterior free border of it, to which is attached the palatine aponeurosis of the soft pellet. So you remember aponeurosis, it is a thick, thick, deep fascia. Now the heart pellet, so it's fond of bones, contains anteriorly, anteriorly an opening, which is called the incisive fossa. Sometimes this is opened and this leads to passage of bronze of greater palatine and lesser palatine nerves and vessels into this toward the, the nasal, nasal cavity. In the posterolateral angle, we have two other foramina, which are the greater palatine foramen, this one, and the posterolateral to it is the lesser palatine foramina. These two foramina communicates the roof of the oral cavity with the pterygopalatine fossa, through them descends from the pterygopalatine fossa, the greater palatine vessels from the maxillary artery and lesser palatine vessel from the maxillary artery and then from the maxillary nerve. Maxillary nerve descends the greater palatine nerve and lesser palatine nerve which supplies the palate. Now the heart pellet is covered, it's covered with mucous membrane and some mucosa. On this side here, the mucous membrane has been removed with the submucosa to show the bones and the nerves and vessels. The mucosa of the heart pellet is firmly attached to the, to the bone and there is very little space. The submucosa contains, contains large number of mucus secreting glands and some minor cerebral glands. Collectively, we call them palatine, palatine glands. Palatine glands are a mix of, you know, of cerebral, minor cerebral and mucus secreting, secreting glands and some contains adipose tissue, but it's usually firmly attached to the underlying periosteum. It shows in the anterior portion transverse rugies, transverse palatine rugies, these transverse folds of mucus, mucus membrane, and between, behind the two incisors, 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 there is, there is a small papilla, which is called incisive, incisive papilla, it's just a rounded folding of the, mucous membrane. Sorry, I should answer and, and phone. Now the adherence of the mucous membrane to the mucosa, this makes any infection in the area, leads to severe pain because there is no space, no space, and this leads to severe pressure on the nerve endings leading to severe, severe pain. This is for the heart, heart pellet. So a heart pellet formed of palatine process of maxilla and horizontally played of palatine bone. It's covered by thick mucus bound tightly to the underlying periosteum. Some mucosa and lateral region contain, you know, as you have seen, the mucus secreting glands, salivary glands, and adipose tissue. The mucosa is orthokeratinized, stratified squamous epithelium. Orthokeratinized, it means this change. The quantity of keratinization of it changes according to the pressure applied to the, to the mucosa. If there is more pressure, then there will be more keratinization. If there is less pressure, there will be less, less keratinization, and that's why it's called orthokeratinized. It's not completely correct keratinized, but it's ortho, the keratin quantity changes according to the circumstances, circumstances of the quantity of pressure applied to the, to the mucosa. The plate and raffi is midline, is anterior extremities, as I said, in the anterior is the incisive papilla. 
transverse folds of connective tissue running laterally. These we call them transverse rubies. Posterior half contain numerous mucus palatine salivary glands. They secrete through numerous ducts directly into the surface. We will study this later on. Though bilaterally larger, collect sometimes these to open at paired palatine fovea. This is not constant, situated at posterior border of heart palate at mid midline. Now, as I say, to the posterior free border of the heart palate is attached, is attached the soft, the soft palate. Now, the soft palate from its name is formed of soft tissue. It's formed of an aponeurosis, which is called palatine aponeurosis, which is a thick, flat sheet of dense, irregular connective tissue, which is partly shown here, this whitish membrane. This is attached to the posterior free border of the heart, heart palate, and then passes backward to extend into the, the into the oropharynx, into the oropharynx, like that, come conical, conical in shape, forming a flap. Attached to this on each side of this palatine aponeurosis are five, five muscles. Five muscles on each side are attached to this palatine aponeurosis, to this palatine aponeurosis coming from the outside. One of them is, is intrinsic. So you have 10 muscles in the soft palate. And then they are covered all by mucous membrane and sub mucosa which is continuous with that of the heart palate the superior surface is continuous with the mucosa of the nose of course because as we said this forms the floor of the or the roof of the oral cavity and the floor of the nasal cavity at the same time from the other side now so the soft palate is formed of palatine aponeurosis which is this one Attached to it are five, five layers, five muscles on each on each side, and then covered with mucous membrane. So since it is formed of skeletal muscles, this is a mobile, a mobile flap. A mobile flap, it becomes straight, extends upward toward the nasopharynx, descend downward toward the oro, oropharynx during, ins during inspiration, inspiration, taking, your breath then does descend downward and during deglutition or eating food or swallowing then this extends upward to close the nasopharynx from the oropharynx. Now the five muscles attached to palatine aponeurosis, these either comes from the outside or emerge from a dent pass to the outside, and some one of them is confined to the, or limited to the soft palate. The smallest of these is the musculus uvili. The musculus uvili is this one. Two muscles, they are triangular in shape, arise from the posterior border of the palatine aponeurosis, one on each side, one midline, and then they fuse with each other, project backward to life freely between the oro and nasal pharynx. Covered with mucous membrane, this will they form what is called the uvula. Uvula containing two, two musculus uvili, two uvular muscles. They form the uvula covered with mucous membrane. We call the uvula or what's called the san, the san el mismar. This projects, projects from the posterior free border of the soft palate between the oro and the nasopharynx. You can see it if you look to the oral cavity, the oral cavity, and it's a mobile, mobile conical posterior end of the soft palate. Now, in addition, on each side of the soft palate, you have four other muscles. Two of them arise from the palatine aponeurosis and then passes to the outside. These two are, first we have the palatoglossus muscle. 
This is the palatoglossus muscle. Palatoglossus muscle. From its name, palatoglossus, this arises from the inferior surface of palatine aponeurosis, descend downward and laterally to be inserted into the lateral, lateral side of the posterior one third of the tongue. Palato from palate and glossus from the tongue. Glossus, gloss so it means tongue. And lisan. So this is the palatoglossal muscle. Now, from the posterior aspect of the inner inferior surface of the palatine aponeurosis, emerge another muscle, medial and posterior medial to the palatoglossus. This is palatopharyngeus muscle. The palatopharyngeus muscle here, this again arises from the inferior surface of palatine aponeurosis and then descend downward to fade away in the lateral wall of the, of the pharynx. Each of these two muscles is covered with mucous membrane, of course. Here is covered with mucous membrane, and with the mucous membrane, we call them palatoglossal folds and palatopharyngeal folds. So a fold, it means mucous membrane with a muscle inside, inside it. These two folds, or muscles, they leave a small fossa between them. This is the palato pharyngeal fold and this is the palatoglossal fold these the fossa between them this is called the tonsillar tonsillar fossa and this tonsillar fossa contains the palatine tonsil these they lie just behind the tongue if you depress the tongue you can see these two palatoglossal and palatopharyngeal arch descending downward from the soft palate and between them lying the palatine tonsils on each side behind the tongue. They guard the entry from the oral cavity toward the oral pharynx. The palatine tonsils because they are fond of aggregation of lymph and tissue and they act as a defense, defense mechanism. So this is for the Three muscles now, muscle as you believe we said on each side, small confined to the soft palate, and then we have the palatoglossal and palatopharyngeal muscles with the tonsillar fossa between them containing the palatine, palatine tonsil. Now these, they form boundaries of entry into, into the oropharynx here from the oral cavity. These, they form the soft palate with the uvula, then you have these two folds on each side, and then the posterior, one third of the tongue. Here is the opening into the oropharynx. Oropharynx, and this we call it the isthmus of fossies. So the isthmus of fossies is bounded by soft palate uvula, palatopharyngeal, palatoglossal arch, with the with the tonsillar fossa, and then the posterior one third of the tongue. This leads into the into the oropharynx. We call it isthmus of falsies. Now we pass to the rest of the other muscles of the soft palate. Here in this sagittal, in this sagittal section, in the sagittal section of the head and neck, here is the heart palate, and this is the soft palate. And this is the musculus uvulae extending from it. Here is the palatoglossus, palatoglossus muscle. This is the pharyngeal, pharyngeal wall. And this is the palatopharyngeus muscle. This is the posterior one third of the tongue. And here is the lateral wall of the nasal cavity. Structures are removed to show the other two muscles of the of the soft palate. These two are called the tensor villi palatine muscle. Tensor villi palatine, tensor villi palatine muscle arises, arises from the scaphoid fossa of the medial pterygoid plate of pterygoid process of sphenoid, descend downward to be attached to the lateral side of the, sorry, descend from that and then curves, curves over the pterygoid hamulus by 90 degrees to become to become horizontal and inserts into the palatine aponeurosis. So 
contraction of the tenses to solve flat, make it flat and make it tense. This is the tensor villi palatini muscle. Descent here on the side, curves by 90 degrees along the pterygoid humulus and then inserts into the palatine aponeurosis. The other muscle is the levator villi palatini muscle. This is the levator villi palatini, levator villi palatini. This comes again from upward, from the lateral aspect of the medial pterygoid plate and part of the auditory tube. The cartilaginous part of the auditory tube arising, arises from there, from the cartilaginous part of the auditory tube and then descend to be attached to the superior surface of the palatine upon neurosis. Contraction of this, it elevates the soft, soft, soft palate, which occurs during the deglutition. These two contracts, the tensor villi palatini and elevator villi palatini, they elevate it and make it, make it straight. So closing the, the, the nasopharynx, which is here, from the oropharynx, which is, which is here. These two muscles, again, on this side, you have removed. This is the mandible has been removed with the temporomandibular joint. This is the external acoustic meters. This is the pterygoid process, the lateral pterygoid, pterygoid plate. Here is the boxinator muscle. This is the pterygomandibular raphe with the superior, superior constrictor. These two muscles, you see, they should enter inside the tensor villi palatine muscle and the levator villi palatine muscle, they enter inside to pass toward the, toward the soft palate. Again, here in this schematic diagram, here is the, the levator tensor villi palatine and levator villi palatine muscle above the superior constrictor, they enter inside, inside the soft Palette. Here again, you see this is the soft palate. Here are the posterior nasal cavity to the nasal cavity. This is the pharynx opened. This is the posterior one third of the tongue of the tongue. These are the palatoglossal and palatopharyngeal. This is palatopharyngeal arch, and this is the tonsillar fossa. This is the uvula, the uvula of the soft palate, and this is the levator villi palatine palatine muscle attached to the soft to the soft. And this is the palatopharyngeus muscle. So two muscles come from above and two muscles descend downward from the palatine aponeurosis with the muscular uvili uvili. It's, it's here. This is the isthmus of fossis leading into the oral cavity bounded by the soft palate with the, these two palatopharyngeal and palatoglossal glossal arch entering into this oral. Facts. Here again to show the soft palate with the muscles with the muscles inside it. This is the musculus, the musculus UVD. This is the rich fold covering the mucous membrane, covering the elevator villi palatine muscle. So we have seen that the soft palate is formed of Five muscles. Now, next, the soft palate, it's covered like the arch palate with mucous membrane, which is again the same thing on the inferior surface of it, is of orthokeratinized certified squamous epithelium containing sebaceous mucus and, and salivary, salivary glands. So it's covered just like the arch palate with mucous membrane, but the superior surface of the soft palate is covered by respiratory mucosa because it's on the respiratory system, which is pseudo-stratified ciliated, squamous ciliated epithelium. Now, the nerve supply of the pellets, of the pellet sensory supply is through the greater palatine, lesser palatine nerves supplying sensory to the mucous membrane. You feel touch, pain, temperature. And then, then we have parasympathetic supply and sympathetic supply. This, these come together with these nerves from the pterygopalatine ganglia for the parasympathetic supply in the pterygopalatine fossa, supplying the, the glands, the salivary, the mucous glands, and this is secretomotor for the glands. It enhances secretion of saliva and, and the mucus. 
the sympathetic sympathetic again comes from the plexus around the maxillary artery join these these sensory nerves and spread to the glands which is inhibitory to the glands so these greater palatine and lesser palatine nerves they contain they contain sensory postganglionic parasympathetic and postganglionic sympathetic fibers for the supply of the glands and the sensory for the mucous membrane now what remains is the muscles of the soft palate we said you have five muscles musculus uvili palatoglossus palatopharyngeus tensor villi palatine and levator villi palatine muscles all these muscles they are supplied by vago accessory complex which means vagus nerve which is branch this branch from vagus which is the 10th cranial nerve and cranial accessory nerve which is the 11th 11th cranial nerve this branch cranial part of the accessory joins the vagus nerves and together they supply all these muscles except the tensor villi palatine muscle the tensor villi palatine which is this one this is supplied by mandibular nerve this is because this muscle is derived from the first pharyngeal arch embryologically and that's why it's supplied by mandibular nerve just like the muscles of mastication the rest of the muscles they are supplied by the vago accessory vago accessory complex the action of the muscles as i said levator villi palatine elevates soft palate tensor it tenses the soft palate the two palatoglossal and palatopharyngeal depresses depresses the soft palate which occurs during respiration while the other two these contract during degradation and elevate and tenses makes it straight to close the nasopharynx from the other pharynx preventing regurgitation of food into the nasal pharynx the blood supply again is the same greater and lesser palatine arteries together with ascending palatine which supplies in addition the soft palate and the tonsillar tonsillar fossa so as i said the soft palate mobile flap suspended from posterior border of heart palate thick fold of mucosa enclosing muscles aponeurosis neurovascular tissue of the glands inferior oral surface is concave with median raphe superior nasal surface is slightly convex formed floor of nasal pharynx anteriorly is attached to the heart palate posterior border posteriorly is free hanging between mouth and pharynx and sides blend with the pharyngeal walls. Uvula is median conical process projecting from its posterior border. Two palatal arches to curve for the mucosa of muscles. The hemopalatoglossal contains palatoglossus muscle. Descend to sides of the posterior one third of the tongue. Palatopharyngeal posteriorly contains palatopharyngeal muscle descends to the lateral wall of the pharynx. The mucosa is tightly attached, as I said. Now, five muscles, tensor villi palatine from scaphoid fossa, spine of sphenoid, and cartilage of auditory tube. Passes inferiorly, tendon hooks around pterygoid amulets to spread out as a palatine upon neurosis, tenses soft palate, opens auditory tube. The vetter villi palatine from cartilage of auditory tube, petrous part of temporal to attach to superior surface of palatine upon neurosis. It elevates soft palate. Palatoglossus descend from palatine aponeurosis to the side of posterior one third of tongue. It depresses soft palate, elevates posterior one third of tongue. Palatopharyngeus from heart palate and palatine aponeurosis to lateral walls of oropharynx, tenses soft palate, pulls walls of pharynx severely. Musculus uvulae from posterior nasal spine and palatine aponeurosis to fading mucosa uvula, free posterior and shortens uvula and pulls it superiorly. All muscles are supplied, as I said, by vago accessory complex, cranial part of accessory of vagus, except tensor villi palatine, which is supplied by mandibular nerve through the 
branch to medial pterygoids. Blood supply, the rich blood supply from greater palatine, lesser palatine, and descending palatine from facial vein drain into pterygoid plexus. Sensory nerve supply accompanied by postganglionic, parasympathetic, and sympathetic from pterygoid palatine ganglia and superior cervical sympathetic ganglia to greater palatine, mesopalatine, and lesser palatine. Now, 